Chapter Five of A Mysterious Disappearance by Louis Tracy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Five, at the Jolty Theater. By tacit consent, Claude and his fair companion dropped for the hour the roles of inquisitor and witness. They were both excellent talkers. They were mutually interested and there was in their present escapade a spice of that romance not so lacking in the humdrum life of London as is generally supposed to be the case. Bruce did not ask himself what tangible result he expected from this quaint outcome of his visit to Sloane Square. It was too soon yet. He must trust to the vagaries of chance to elucidate many things now hidden. Meanwhile, a good dinner, a bright theatre, and the society of a smart, nice-looking woman were more than tolerable substitutes for progress. As a partial explanation of his somewhat eccentric behavior, he volunteered a lively account of a recent course célèbre in which he had taken a part, but the details of which had been rigidly kept from the public. He more than hinted that Mr. Sidney Corbett had figured prominently in the affair, and Mrs. Hilmer laughed with unrestrained mirth at the unwanted appearance of her brother in the character of Lothario. "'Tell me,' said Bruce confidentially, when a couple of glasses of Moet 89 had consolidated friendly relations, "'what sort of a fellow is this brother of yours?' "'Not in any case a bad boy, but a trifle wild. He will not live an ordinary life, and at times he has been hard-pressed to live at all. As a matter of fact, it is this scrape he blundered into with Messrs. Dodge and Company that induced him to masquerade temporarily under an assumed name. Then what is his real name? Ah, now you are pumping me again. I refuse to tell. But there are generally serious reasons when a man disguises himself in such a fashion. The reason he gave me was that he dreaded being written for liability regarding the shares I mentioned to you. It was good enough. Now you come with this story of meddling with somebody else's wife. Surely this is an additional reason. I supplied him with funds until we quarreled, and then he went off in a huff. What did you quarrel about? That concerns me only. Mrs. Hilmer was so emphatic that Bruce dropped the subject. When they drove to the theatre, Mrs. Hilmer, on alighting at the entrance, said to her coachman, You may return home now and bring Dobson to meet me at 11.15. May I venture to inquire who Dobson is? said Claude. Certainly, Dobson is my maid. This woman puzzled him the more he saw of her. He was now quite positive that she lived on the fringe of society. Her status was, at the best, dubious. Yet he had never heard of her before, nor met her in public. None of his friends were known to her, and she mentioned no one beyond those popular personages who are connu of all the world. She was obviously wealthy and refined, with more than a spice of unconventionality. At times, too, beneath her habitual expressions of lively and vivacious interest, there was a touch of melancholy. For an instant her face grew sad when her eyes rested on a typical family party of father, mother and two girls who occupied seats in the row of stalls directly in front of her. For some reason Bruce felt sorry for Mrs. Hilmer. He regretted that the exigencies of his quest forced him to make her his dupe, and he resolved that, if by any chance her scapegrace brother were concerned in Lady Dyke's death, Mrs. Hilmer should, if possible, be spared personal humiliation or disgrace. Indeed, he had formed such a favorable opinion of her that he made up his mind to conduct his future investigations without causing her to assist involuntarily in putting a halter around her relative's neck. Nevertheless, it was impossible to avoid getting some further information, as the lady herself paved the way for it. Her comments betrayed such an accurate acquaintance with the technique of the stage that he said to her, you must have acted a good deal. No, she said, not very much. But I was stage-struck when young. But you have not appeared in public. 
Yes, some six years ago. I worked so hard that I fell ill, and then... then I got married. Do you go out much to theaters nowadays? Very little. It is lonely by oneself, and there are so few plays worth seeing. Bruce wondered why she insisted so strongly upon the isolation of her existence. In his newfound sympathy, he forbore to question, and she continued, When I do visit a theater, I amuse myself mostly by silent criticism of the actors and actresses. Not that I could do better than many of them, or half so well, but it passes the time. I hope you don't regard killing time as your main occupation. It is so, I fear, however hard I may strive otherwise. And again, that shadow of regret darkened the fair face. Someone in front turned around and glared at them angrily, for the famous comedian Mr. Prospect Riggs was singing his deservedly famous song, It Was All Because I Buttoned Up Her Boots, so the conversation dropped for the moment. Claude focused his opera glasses on the stage. While his eyes wandered idly over the pretty faces and shapely limbs of the quarry face, his brain was busy piecing together all that he had heard. The odd coincidence of the dates of Lady Dyke's murder and the speedy departure of the self-styled Sidney Corbett for the Riviera would require a good deal of explanation by the latter gentleman. True, it was not the barrister's habit to jump at conclusions. There might be a perfectly valid motive for the journey. If the man did not desire his whereabouts to be known, why did he leave his address at the post office? And then, what possible reason could Lady Dyke have in visiting him voluntarily and secretly at his chambers in Rayleigh Mansions? This virtuous and high-principled lady could have nothing in common with a careless adventurer, taking the most lenient view of his sister's description of him. And as Bruce's subtle brain strove vainly to match the queer fragments of the puzzle, his keen eyes roved over the stage in aimless activity. Suddenly they paused. His power of vision and mental analysis were alike inadequate to the new and startling fact which had obtruded itself, unmasked and unsought for, upon his sight. Among the least prominent of the chorus girls, posturing and moving with the stiffness and visible anxiety of the novice, who is not yet accustomed to the glare of the footlights upon undraped limbs, was one in whose every gesture Bruce took an absorbing interest. He was endowed in full measure with that prime requisite in the detection of criminals, an unusually good memory for faces, together with the artistic faculty of catching the true expression. Hence it was that, after the whirl of a dancing chorus had for a few seconds brought this particular member of the company close to the proscenium, Bruce became quite sure of having developed at least one branch of his inquiry within measurable distance of its conclusion. The girl on the stage was Jane Harding, Lady Dyke's maid. When her features first flashed upon his conscious gaze, he could hardly credit the discovery. But each instant of prolonged scrutiny placed the fact beyond doubt. Not even the makeup and the elaborate wig could conceal the contour of her pretty, if insipid, face. And a slight trick she had of dropping the left eyelid when thinking confirmed him in his belief. So astounded was he at this sequel to his visit to the theater that he utilized every opportunity of a full stage to examine still further the appearance and style of this strange apparition. When the curtain fell and Jane Harding had vanished, he was brought back to actuality by Mrs. Hilmer's voice. Fie, Mr. Bruce, you are taking altogether too much notice of one of the fair ladies in front. Which one is it? The tall standard bearer or the little girl who period so gracefully? Neither, I assure you. I was taken up by wondering how a young woman manages to secure employment in a theatre for the first time. I think I can tell you. Influence goes a long way. Talent occasionally counts. Then a well-known agent may, for a nominal fee, 
get an opening for a handsome, well-built girl who has taken lessons from either himself or some of his friends in dancing or singing, or both. Is such a thing possible for a domestic servant? It all depends upon the domestic servant's circle of acquaintances. As a rule, I should say not. A theatre like this requires a higher average of intelligence. This and more Bruce well knew, but he was only making conversation while he thought intently, almost fiercely, upon the latest phase of his strange quest. During the third act, he devoted more time to Mrs. Hilmer. If that sprightly dame were a little astonished at the celerity with which he conducted her to the carriage and the waiting Dobson, it was banished by the nice way in which he thanked her for the pleasure she had conferred. "'The enjoyment has been mostly on my side,' she cried, as he stood near the window of her brougham. "'Come to see me again soon.' He bowed and would have said something, if an imperious policeman had not ordered the coachman to make way for the next vehicle. So Mrs. Hilmer was whisked into the traffic. From force of habit, he glanced casually at the crowd struggling through the exit of the theatre, and he caught sight of Mr. White, who, too late, averted his round eyes and strove to shield his portly form in the portico of a neighboring restaurant. He did not want to be bothered by the detective just then. He lit a cigarette, and Mr. White slid off quietly into the stream of traffic, finally crossing the road and jumping on to a Charing Cross bus. So, said Claude to himself, White has been watching Rayleigh Mansions and watching me too. Upon my honor, I shouldn't wonder if he suspected me of the murder. I am glad I saw him just now. For the next couple of hours I wish to be free from his interference. Waiting a few moments to make sure that White had not detailed an aide de camp to continue the surveillance, he buttoned his overcoat to the chin, tilted his head forward, and strolled round to the stage door of the Jolty Theatre. End of chapter 5